Welcome to this video. I gotta tell you right off the bat, this is gonna be a boring video. Yep. Nothing exciting at all. Nothing titillating. No extreme mountain biking shots. Nothing dramatic. Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant, the chest the Hebrews used to carry around the Ten Commandments. What do you what mean, do you mean commandments? You're talking about the Ten Commandments? Yes, the actual Ten Commandments. Did you guys ever go to Sunday school? Just history and nothing but history. Yep. Boring. If this is your first time watching the channel, my name is David Paris and you're watching the Caffeinated Bible. The goal here is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and bring it to you on YouTube. So if you find these videos useful and educational, please give it a thumbs up, share, and hit that subscribe button and YouTube will let you know why I post another video. Okay, back to our incredibly boring content for this video. In order to understand anything, you have to understand its context. That goes from a thingamabob that you might find in the street to a picture. Take a look at this picture. I've zoomed in so that you can't see what's framing around this one particular shot and give away its context. So let's zoom out a little bit more and see if you can figure out what's going on here. Ah, now we can begin to hazard perhaps a guess. And finally, if I show you the whole shot, you get an idea of what the photo is all about. But let me give you some context here in order for you to understand this picture a little bit better. First, this is taken on the grounds of the Air Force Academy. Second, I'm on my mountain bike because that's what I like to do. And third, this B-52 that's behind me in the picture, my father-in-law flew that bomber during the Vietnam War. So you see how the context of that picture and my connection to it helps you understand it more. To help you understand the Bible, what I'd like to do today is give you a big picture of the history of the Bible. And we're going to move fast. I'm going to draw a timeline here today to help hold all the information we're going to cover together. And I want you to know that I'm going to try and take sort of a middle of the road approach, not too conservative, not too critical. This is not going to please everyone, but I'm going to take sort of a seven out of eight dentists prefer this approach. There are only a few dates that almost everyone agrees on, likely when Israel was carried off into Babylonian captivity or when Jesus died. For the sake of simplicity, let's take five broad historical periods to organize this sprint through history. The first historical period is Joseph and the Egyptian captivity. Why am I going to start with Joseph? Because when Joseph goes down to Egypt and then suing captivity, we can start comparing historical dates, information, artifacts, inscriptions. In other words, historians can actually start debating times, date, places for these things. Prior to Joseph going down to Egypt, for example, you have Abraham wandering around. He starts off in Ur of the Chaldeans, goes to Haran, ends up in the Promised Land, down to Egypt and back. But we really don't have names, dates, places, and things like this that we can start cross-comparing with other historical records. This isn't to say that the life of Abraham did not occur or he didn't go on those journeys. I'm just simply saying that for historical purposes, it's very, very hard to do any sort of cross-comparison or sort of study to date the life of Abraham. That's why we're starting with Joseph, because now we can start nailing things down. One of the strengths of the ancient Egyptians is that they inscribed their temples and other monumental buildings with all kinds of history and inscriptions. In fact, it seems like they were rather OCD about it. This gives us a lot of data to compare the biblical account to, and there's a lot of debate about where the Egyptians and the Israelites overlapped and who's referring to who at different points in time. But it gives us something to work off. Now, if you want to know more about the biblical account before Joseph, I've got 10 videos on the book of Genesis, and I'll have a link up here and underneath this video to that series if you want to take a look at them. The book of Genesis concludes with Joseph being sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers. What was meant as evil turns out to be a blessing. Joseph rises to the position of being advisor to Pharaoh and is able to prepare Egypt for a coming famine. Joseph and his brothers are then forced to migrate down to Egypt as well in order to have food. So if I draw a line that represents history, I'm going to have a line coming down from Joseph descending from the north 
down into Egypt. Let's say that Joseph and his brothers migrate to Egypt somewhere between 1800 to 1500 BC. Israel is forced into slavery for 400 years in Egypt, and during their time in Egypt, they are transformed from a fairly large family or small tribe to a distinct ethnic group that are made into slaves within Egypt. This brings us to the Exodus and the conquest of the Promised Land. After 400 years, God raises up Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt to the Promised Land, flowing with milk and honey. But it's not quite as simple as that. Israel will spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. During this time, the law will be given, instructions about the tabernacle and how they are to worship God. It's a tough time of learning various lessons, failures, and being disciplined. At the end of those 40 years, only two of the original Israelites who left Egypt will make it to the Promised Land, Joshua and Caleb. Not even Moses will be allowed in. The rest have died during those 40 years wandering in the wilderness. This would then date Israel's crossing of the Jordan River into the Promised Land somewhere between 1400 and 1100 BC, depending on whether you take a minimal or a maximal view here. This brings us to our second historical period, the Judges and a United Kingdom. Dating the Book of Judges is extremely difficult to determine. Some see this as taking place over 400 years, others give it about 100 years in time frame. The problem is, is that this book revolves around seven cycles of the people of Israel forgetting their covenant to God. God then raises up some foreign nation to subjugate them. The people cry out for relief. God raises up a judge to deliver the people. For example, Samuel, Gideon, or Deborah. The question is, is this about seven chronological cycles or do they overlap in time with one another? For the sake of the timeline, let's put this down to a 400 year period from around 1400 to around 1000 BC. Or if you take the mineral view, from 1100 to around 1000 BC. Because that makes a nice way to remember the date 1000 when we have the beginning of the kingdom. The book of Judges ends its time frame on a very ominous note. It says that in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, Judges 21-25. That then sets us up for the transition to Israel's monarchy. The books of 1 and 2 Samuel record the difficult transition of going from a tribal nation with judges to that of a monarchy. Their first king is Saul, and he walks into a difficult position for which he was badly underprepared to lead. David comes after Saul, while he's a stronger leader, he suffers from his own personal and family problems as a king. Solomon comes after David. He rules wisely, but he is judged for forming alliances with other nations. And one of the primary ways you accomplished that in the ancient Near East was by marrying one of the daughters of their family into your family. That way, instead of coming up to invade you, Pharaoh would be more interested in seeing the grandkids. This brings us to the third historical period, the fall of the divided kingdoms. The divisions between the royal household come to a head when Solomon dies and his sons Jeroboam and Rehoboam vie for the throne. The resulting division in the nation also reveals how the 12 tribes had never successfully formed a national identity, but kept their tribal affiliations. One of the things to keep in mind in all these historical time periods is that Israel occupies a narrow slip of land along the Mediterranean Sea. This narrow slice of land is where most of the major ancient highways were located if one wanted to travel from the south to the north. Related to that is that in the northeast we have the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys. This is where some of the main ancient cultures will develop and be located within this region of the world. To the southwest, you have the Nile and the Egyptian empires. This places Israel directly between two centers of ancient superpowers. And any time there was a conflict between them, Israel will be right in the middle of it. In fact, the only times when Israel is able to thrive, for example, under David or Solomon, is when the main superpowers are either weak or preoccupied somewhere else. 
Otherwise, they find themselves being sucked into the middle of conflicts that are bigger than they are. We need to get back to Solomon's divided family here. Rehoboam appears to be the natural choice to succeed Solomon, but instead of taking the advice of his elders and offering concessions to the ten tribes in the north, he decides that he's going to rule as a really, really tough king. The ten tribes north of Jerusalem, which never really seem to have fully bought into the whole idea of a Judean monarchy, succeed. They decide to follow Solomon's other son, Jeroboam, instead. Israel splits. Ten northern tribes are now referred to as Israel, and the two southern tribes are referred to as Judah. This is really a split of biblical proportions, a split that will never be fully resolved. These two nations will go to war against each other, stab each other in the back, and generally be the worst possible neighbors one could ask for. According to the biblical historians who wrote, for example, 1st and 2nd Kings, and they tend to come primarily from Judah, Israel has a succession of 19 kings. Not one of them is godly according to the authors of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Judah in the south has 20 kings, eight of which are seen as good or godly kings. Let's zoom out a little bit now so we get a little bit more of the historical context. In 745, the nation of Assyria in modern-day Iraq grows in power. In 722, Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, invades Israel, and the ten northern tribes are captured and they're taken off as slaves. We really don't hear much about them anymore within the biblical account. In their place, he settles the land with people that are loyal to him. Some historians believe that these people that are resettled onto the land of Israel are where the Samaritans come from. People Shalmans are settled there who then adopted the God of Israel as their own. Judah was spared from the Assyrian conquest. However, around 630 BC, Babylon begins to rise in power. They were a nation that was subject to the Assyrians, but now they rebel, get their freedom, and then they decide that they're going to conquer the Assyrian Empire themselves. Soon after that, they turn their eyes on another prize, Egypt. The problem is, is that Judah is in between them and Egypt. In 610 BC, Babylon begins its campaign against Egypt. Egypt, before this, had set up a puppet king in Jerusalem, and it's using Judah as a buffer zone between them and the Babylonians. So in order to attack the Egyptians, the Babylonians launch three successive campaigns against Judah in the process in 606, 598, and they finish the job in 596 BC. This brings us to the period of the Babylonian captivity from around 600 BC to around 530 BC. In 596, Judah is completely conquered. The walls of the city are torn down, the city is burned, and the temple is pillaged. This is when the Ark of the Covenants disappears. It's taken off as a war treasure by the Babylonians. And finally, any able-bodied person at all was taken off into slavery in Babylon. While they're in Babylon, the Jewish people are held in captivity for 70 years until the Babylonians are conquered by the Medes. Cyrus, the Persian king, then allows the Jews to return to Jerusalem. This period of captivity defined them as a people, and it shapes the Jewish religion as well. During the captivity, they couldn't worship in the temple. It no longer exists. And the Jewish religious priests would have served no purpose at all for the Babylonians, so they were given other roles and jobs to fill as slaves. But they could take their law and their history with them. As a result, Israel goes from a nation whose religion focused primarily around the temple and was led by priests prior to the captivity to small religious gatherings that were held by the people during their captivity. Instead of priests, what the people needed now were teachers. So when they returned from captivity after 70 years, they have a very, very different religious life. During the captivity, they take on the nickname of the people of the book. Scribes, synagogues, and synagogue means to gather together, and teachers take a dominant role in the Jewish religious life. For example, 
Ezra is not only from the tribe of Levi, but he is described as a scribe of the law. Ezra 7.12 and Nehemiah 8.13. So when they return from the Babylonian captivity, they now bring with them a focus on the law and teaching. You have this new class of religious leaders, scribes and teachers, and you have this new way to worship. It's in small gatherings together, which in Greek are referred to as synagogues. This brings us to our fourth historical period. The Old Testament closes about 100 years after their return to Jerusalem. The nation is weak economically, militarily, and religiously. And the books of Haggai, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Malachi focus on the attempt to rebuild Israel during that period in all of these areas. Between the Old and the New Testaments, the Bible doesn't record much for us, unless you read the Apocrypha. But a lot happens during this time period. Let's zoom out a little bit more once again. When the Persian Empire began to decline around 500 BC, the Greeks were able to emerge on the world scene. The Golden Age of Greece occurs between 480 and 430 BC after the fall of the Persian Empire. And it's during this short 50 year period that all of the great Greek advances in art, literature, and democracy take place. About 100 years later, Alexander the Great comes on the scene and he decides that ruling Greece is just a little bit too claustrophobic for him and he decides that he's going to conquer the known world. And he extends the Greek empire to modern day Afghanistan and all the way down into Egypt. However, like Solomon, his empire divides on his death. The Ptolemies take control of Egypt and the southern portion of the empire. The Seleucids take control of modern day Greece, Turkey, Iraq, and Iran. Like we saw with the Babylonians and the Egyptians, now Israel is stuck between the Seleucids to the north and the Ptolemies to the south. Shortly after 200 BC, Antiochus, who is the Seleucid Empire in the north, decides that the Ptolemies down south there in Egypt are weak, and he decides that now is the time to unify the empire of Alexander the Greek under him. In 170 BC, he sets out to conquer Egypt, and guess who was right smack in the middle of his path? Israel. On his way down to conquer Egypt, he subjugated Israel. But Israel is not playing well with his game. They constantly rebel. And so he appoints his own high priest in Jerusalem. And then in 168 BC, that high priest then offered a pig on the altar in Jerusalem. This was the straw that broke the camel's back. Antiochus' defilement of the temple was just too much for the people and they revolted against the Seleucids. In a bloody guerrilla warfare, the people of Israel are able to win their freedom from the Seleucids. Meanwhile, all is not quiet on the Western Front. Rome grows from a small kingdom to a major world power. In 150 BC, it conquered Carthage in North Africa. In 133 BC, it sacked Corinth and solidified their control of Greece. And in 63 BC, it defeated the remains of the Seleucid Empire and annexed Syria and Israel in the process. This brings us to the fifth historical period, the time frame of the New Testament. We really can't talk about the period of the New Testament without saying something about Herod the Great. As a puppet state under the Romans, Israel's kings needed the support and the approval from Rome in order to hold the throne. This is how Herod the Great came to rule Palestine in 37 BC. Herod did this by ruthlessly suppressing any opposition. He even had three of his own sons and his favorite wife executed. Augustus Caesar said that he would rather have been one of Herod's pigs than one of his sons in light of this. It's into this context that Jesus, the promised king of the Jews, is born somewhere between 6 and 4 BC. He lived and died within an Israeli nation that was under Roman control. After his death around 33 BC, his followers are then able to capitalize off the Roman Empire to spread the church. The Roman Empire may not have been the most ideal situation to live in, but the church was born in it and the empire did afford several factors that facilitated the spread of the gospel. 
First, the Roman Empire provided a safe means of travel on land and sea. In fact, when you read the New Testament, you should be surprised by the amount of travel that goes on in the book of Acts and in Paul's letters. Second, if you knew either Greek or Latin, you could conduct business and travel within most of the Roman Empire. Third, safe travel and a shared language made trade between cities more feasible and profitable. This meant that large urban centers became more important, a key feature that helps you understand Paul's missionary itineraries, why he goes from city to city rather than out into the rural countryside. And also, when you read the letters in the New Testament, notice how often these major cities are mentioned. It's also worth noting that in terms of the overall biblical history, the New Testament covers a very narrow sliver of that history, only around 60 to 70 years at most. Well, this has been sort of a light speed survey of biblical history. My goal was not to dive into every nook and cranny of biblical history, but to give you an overview of the timeline so that you can understand the macro picture of the Bible. This will then help you understand and hang all the little details off it. If you found this helpful, please let others know about the channel. Smash that thumbs up button and subscribe. I can't promise you anything, but I am planning on a slightly more exciting video next week. And that's all I can say for now. Probably said too much already. Until then, Peace.